morning. Could you please stand and turn in your hymnals to page 343.
seems like everything's tuned up this morning, huh? <laughs> good job, good job. Love to hear it. So we're glad you're here today. We're glad that we can be in the house of the Lord today and, and serve him, uh, God Almighty. So uh, looking forward to the message coming today and uh, just, uh, just an awesome time that we can spend and glorify him today. So let's just take this opportunity and let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Father, we come to you today, and we're so thankful that we can be in your house, Lord, to serve you, to glorify your name. Father, we know that the darkness of this world is upon us, and it gets darker and darker each and every day, it seems like. But as that darkness comes, we know that the dawn's coming and we know that your son is going to come back and we're looking for that day to meet him in the clouds. There's many people out in this world that don't know you as Lord and Savior. I just pray that we would be obedient to what you call us to do, to go out there and to share the gospel with those people that are on the road of perishing. Father, we look, we look and we see our country and what, what it's gone through and what a shame. Father, I pray that this wickedness would stop, that they would be brought to shame. But, Father, you call us as people, as children of you, to go out into the world and to go and share the good news, to be the salt and the light that you command us to be. Without Christ, they have no hope. Help us to be obedient to what you call us to do. I ask that you please be with those missionaries around the world as they're proclaiming the good news to those people. But, Father, we long for your coming, and we're looking forward to that day when we can meet you in the clouds and that we can be home with you. And we're just so thankful that we have that hope. And that hope is not a worldly hope. That hope is a certainty that we will be with you one day in paradise. We ask all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A few announcements I'd like to bring forth at this time. Of course, here shortly, September 6th, Christ Seekers will be starting. So be mindful of that. And that starts at 7 o'clock. That would be on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. So be mindful of that. Um, have your kids invite friends out. It's, gonna be, it's always a good uh, time. There's a great curriculum that we go over. It's called Answers in Genesis. It gives us the biblical creation of the earth. It's not this hogwash stuff of evolution. You know, there's no place for evolution in the church. That's not biblical. It's what God, God created everything in six days and he rested on the seventh. And we take that literal. All right? And so the curriculum that we do, that we have, is very, very good, very fundamental. And it goes back to the Word of God and what the Word of God actually says. There's a lot of churches out there that don't look at that as what God says. They look at it as an, in an evolution uh, type of atmosphere, which there's no place for that at all within the Word of God. Um, so be mindful that church, Christ Seekers starting up here shortly uh, in September. Also today um, in the evening we have the Harrison Lake service and there's ice cream at 5.30 and service at 6. So if you can attend to that, uh, be mindful of that. Also August 30th, the uh, prayer meeting uh, at 7 o'clock and September the 2nd, men's breakfast and Bible study at 8 o'clock. Um, and you can read down through there. There's many other things that are happening. Uh, the youth activity, I want to highlight that, um, which is September 3rd. Um, 
with outdoor games and uh, being a cookout so for the for the youth and uh, so be mindful of that also is there any other announcements at this time any anything that needs to be brought forth at this time okay any birthdays <laughs> celebrating birthdays today. Happy birthday. And Larry, you're the youngest out of the bunch, right? Okay, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there any anniversaries today? Celebrating anniversaries. All right. At this time, Michelle Boggs has the kids' moment. for a couple weeks. I'm going to tell you a little story. Back when I was a little girl, I grew up in a really small neighborhood. It was a little tiny town. And all the kids would meet at my house, and we would shine up our bicycles. We would just spit and shine our bicycles. And we had bicycles with banana seats and sissy bars, and we were really cool. And we would ride around the neighborhood, and we had one kid in our group, his name was Toby, and he liked to make really loud noises, like his bike was a motorcycle. And at 5.30 every morning, Toby would be up riding around the neighborhood going, boom, boom, boom. He drove everybody crazy. But anyhow, the neighbors beside us, there was a little old lady. She was like 102 years old, and she didn't have any family, and she always waved at us. We always waved back to Miss Daisy Fritz. And then around the corner at Mrs. Webb's house, she was our second grade teacher. She would always give us a lollipop for our birthday, the big lollipops like on the Wizard of Oz with the lollipop kids. Yeah, we looked forward to that. And her yard was surrounded by glass marbles, and we would walk up, and we would want to look at those marbles, and she'd knock on the window, and she'd say, don't you be stealing my marbles. So, but we rode our bikes around the neighborhood, and we would look for Coke bottles, because if you turned in a Coke bottle, you got 10 cents, and we'd rush off to the candy store, and we'd buy penny candy for 10 cents. And then one day my mom came to me and she said, I need you to go up. I've taken some boxes to your room and I want you to pack your stuff up because we're moving. And I said, you might be moving, but I'm not moving. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to hang out at the river and fish for my own fish to feed myself. She says, what are you going to do in the winter? I said, well, duh, I'm going to build an igloo, right? I'm going to hang out down by the river. See ya. So I packed up my bags, and I was so upset about it. You know what I did? I ran away from home. And unfortunately, the police brought me right back home. So I had to move to the city, and I was so upset about it. But you know what, boys and girls? When I moved to the city, I was going to church, but I had a neighbor that invited me to this really cool group for kids to hang out and learn about Jesus. And then I went to a church youth group, and it was in that youth group that I grew my relationship even deeper with Jesus Christ. So if I never would have moved, who knows what would have happened, right? Sometimes, boys and girls, God moves us 
to grow us. Sometimes he might need our gifts elsewhere. Someday you're going to grow up and you're going to have to maybe move off to college. Your mom and dad, she's going to cry like a baby. But you know what? Because she loves you, she's going to pray for you, and she's going to want you to grow to become the person that God intended you to be. So why is Miss Michelle telling you this? Well, Miss Michelle is telling you this because I'm going to be moving to a different area, and I'm going to be going into some ministry somewhere else. Now, I've had to pray about this for quite a few months, because do you know what the worst part of leaving was? This right here, because boy, I'm going to miss you a whole big bunch. But you know, I've enjoyed the things that we've been able to do together, and God moves us into different seasons of our life so that we can grow and we can share Christ with others. Oh, yes, you'll see me again, because I'm going to keep in touch with your moms on Facebook, and I'm going to see pictures, and I'm going to get to watch you grow up into the fine young ladies and young men that God's called you to be. But I want you to hear me say this. Miss Michelle still loves you a big bunch, and I am so proud of you, and I'm looking forward to watching you grow up. Okay, so this isn't goodbye. It's see you later, alligator. Okay, so... I will come back and visit, okay? But it took a long time for me to pray, but do you know what happened to Jonah when he didn't follow God's plan for him? He ended up in the belly of a whale, right? And I don't want that to happen. But God's going to grow me just like he's going to grow you when you uh, fulfill your callings in your areas of ministry, and he's going to do some different things with me, okay? So I want, I want you to be happy because God is big, God is good, and God's going to find some somebody else that might be able to do this with you because boy I sure have enjoyed it okay so um, I'm gonna ask mr. Tony if he can close in prayer I always give you something as a token to remember what we've talked about right well today I'm gonna ask you to give me something before I leave I want a big hug from you okay all right mr. Tony can you close in prayer for us dear Heavenly Father we thank you for this church Presented this message to them and the things she has done here, and we pray that we can continue to guide and direct these precious children and help them grow spiritually with you and be with you. And we pray for the upcoming service, Lord, that you can quiet our hearts and take away the distractions and help us focus on you. And we give you the praise and glory for all you do. Ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. you take your hymnals and stand and turn to page 75. Thank you. 
Catalina has a special. Thank you so much for that, Catalea. Okay, appreciate that. At this time, Junior Church is dismissed. Very good, Catalea. We do appreciate that so very much. And we do wish Miss Michelle the best as she moves on to wherever the Lord is taking her. Amen? Amen. We're going to hate to see her go, but we know the Lord works in His ways and wants to accomplish His purpose in His time. We understand that. A few weeks ago, we had a golf outing, and I think our golf putter, the best putter, was not here. And I, I haven't anybody that scored below 60. And Melissa, I think you got the honors. Yeah, you. This is your lucky day. The only thing I got to say is don't give this to your husband. All right. Don't, don't, don't share it. I know you share it, but don't share that. Because we'll try to lose our audience. All right. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning before we get into the Word. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness, for your love and your mercy to us. We're so undeserving of your love. We're so undeserving of your mercy. And yet, God, you so love the world, you are not willing that any should perish. And yet, Lord, in spite of all that great love, we do know that there will be men and women that have chose to reject the gospel, chose to reject that love, that offering of yourself at the cross of Calvary so that we could be saved from our sin and have the forgiveness of our sin so that we can have a home in heaven. There will be men and women that will reject that and yet will be so close, having heard it, having been moved by the Spirit of God, convicting their heart, and yet will reject it. Pray, Father, you'll bless the word this morning in a mighty way in hearts as we hear this message, we've heard many times in the past, but yet, Lord, you've given it to be shared today for a reason. And we believe that no doubt there are those today that 
have, are maybe well-churched, have a head knowledge full of facts, can re recite facts, but cannot put their finger on a point in time when they said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and do not have that assurance in their heart of hearts of knowing you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, as we look at the Word this morning, that you'll take the Word and just allow it to speak to our hearts as only you can. As we read it, we see something new and fresh we've never seen before that just pricks and moves our heart. Pray to that end that you'll do that. In Jesus' name, amen. I titled this message, Almost Persuaded. We've been speaking a number of messages the last few weeks dealing with our soul's salvation. And you look across this congregation, you would say, well, why do we need to preach messages strictly on salvation this morning? Well, I think if you're a student of the Word you want to hear the messages. You want your church to preach messages on the subject of salvation. You don't know that the man and woman next to you knows the Lord as their personal Savior. And you want to be sure that they do. You want to be sure that your children have every opportunity to be saved. They hear the gospel. They understand the gospel. They understand what it is to be saved. How awful it would be to leave this life and not have shared the good news with your sons and your daughters and your wife and your husband your aunt, your uncle, and they have not have the opportunity to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I've said many times there's a lot of messages in this book that you can preach, but there is a message that God puts upon the heart that he would have us to preach. And I think the job of the minister is to find that message, not just to find a bunch of sermons that we can preach, no, but to find that sermon that the Lord wants us to preach and to study around it and spend some time in the Word. And I titled the message this morning, Almost Persuaded. Maybe you've had men and women that you've been around, that you have witnessed to, that you've had a great burden for, that you've prayed for, that you have given your all to, that they might come to know Jesus Christ. As much as you want them to come to know Christ, you can't, you can't make that decision for them. You can lead it, well, how's the saying go? You can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink, something like that. You can show a man, you can teach a man, you can give him the best of opportunities to hear the message of the gospel, but you cannot make him make that decision for him or herself. They have to make it on their own. They have to see their need of salvation. They have to repent of their sin, and they have to call out and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to become their Lord and Savior. There might have been men and women that you have in your lifetime, as many of us are older in years, and even those of you who maybe are younger in the schools that you have witnessed to. And maybe they have been right at the brink that you've sensed in your spirit that God is dealing with their soul mightily. They're, they are just broken. They are convicted. They're so close. They just can't seem to let go of the past, let go of their, where they're living. And you just long for them to let go. And, but the decision to let go is made hard because of the family they're connected with, because of the connections that they have in the world with men and women, because of their title, because of their influence, because of the position they hold in the world. It's hard for them to let go because they see those things as great, important things that they need to have in their life, and they just can't in their lost state understand and comprehend how Christ can make my life better without all of that riffraff attached to my life, but those things are a weight that drag them down, that keep them from coming to know Jesus Christ. Here in this message this morning, we're going to see a couple, three examples of the kind of men and women that we meet in the world, that we cross paths with, and potentially you have shared Christ with, that this attitude of heart that these individuals have is the attitude of heart that you and I will cross paths with as we share the words, as we share the gospel. There was a man that I worked with Several men that I'd worked with that I had had, had the, that unique opportunity just in the passing of time. I mean, you're there to do a job but at lunch hour, at break time. They come up and they want to talk. They want to ask questions. And you have the opportunity to share Christ. And there's one man in particular. He was, he was right there. All he had to do was say yes. And I would press him and he would pause and he'd back up and he would say not today. And I remember one particular morning he came to work. And he shared how the, he said, I almost, I almost, almost, I called you last night. I was almost ready to receive Jesus Christ. And it wasn't a week, two weeks, and somebody came to his door and introduced to him, introduced to him the gospel of the lodge. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you are attached to that particular organization. 
But he became attached to that organization. And that organization became his downfall because he did not have the gospel. He followed that became his gospel. But the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, risen again. And if you don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can belong to every lodge in town, out of town, around town, and die and go to a sinner's hell. And his heart just immediately began to harden to the things of the Word of God. There was another man that I had the opportunity to share Christ with only in passing. But he watched the life that you lived. It wasn't perfect. <laughs> but from, a, from, a, from a long shot, being perfect. But he watched the life you lived and had the opportunity to share Christ with him. And boy, I mean to tell you, he was ready. It connected. And he was the last man in the world that you would have ever thought of, of trusting Christ. He was connected with the world. He went to the goose, the moose, the got loose, and all the clubs in town and out of town. He belonged to everything there was to belong to. He was that kind of a guy. He, he, uh, he was just worldly. And he has become a dynamo for Jesus Christ in another church in the community because the gospel of Jesus Christ touched his heart. God doesn't call us to produce the results. He does call us to be faithful, Amen. to be faithful and proclaim the word. In the book of Acts, chapter 24 and chapter 26, Paul, through 26, Paul has been captured. He's gone on trial. He goes on trial before some very powerful men. And I just want to visit some of these accounts of the men that he goes on trial before because we see an example of these powerful men and the influence the gospel had upon them and how they responded to the gospel. Paul had been apprehended and brought before trial before a man by the name of Felix. Felix was appointed by Rome over Judea, and he heard Paul's case. And as you read the account in Acts chapter 24, Paul was, he shares in verse 15 of, of his faith, of his conviction, of his ministry. You'll find him sharing that often. And he says, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And obviously when Felix, if you know anything about Felix and ever read the history on Felix, as well as all of these men I'm going to share with you this morning, they were all wicked. <laughs> they were all ungodly. They were, for the most part, all immoral. And when Paul shares of the resurrection of the dead, you know, there's men today that believe that when you live life and you die, that's the end of it. You're like that cat. You're like your dog. You know, I think there's a book out there, all, there, all dogs go to heaven or something like that. Uh, I, it would be nice, wouldn't it? But boy, it would sure be a loud heaven, wouldn't it, if we had all the dogs that have died and gone to heaven? But uh, there's men and women that have that concept that when this life is over, that's it. It's all done. But that's not true. Because there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And why is there going to be a resurrection of the dead? Because Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Jesus Christ was God in heaven. Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven, put on flesh and blood, came to this earth for the sole purpose of dying for your sin and my sin at the cross. He went to the cross. The full weight of your sin and my sin and the sin of the world was laid upon him at the cross. He died and he paid the condemnation that should be mine. He took the judgment that should be yours and mine. And he went to the grave, but he arose from the grave. He became the first fruit. And he says, he's not just the first. There's going to be more to come because of that resurrection. And Paul says, there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. There's going to be a judgment of the just and the unjust. We want to be found in the just, do we not? And to be found in the just, to be found in the just, we need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, I'm going to stop right here for a minute because I looked out across this congregation and I've seen an honored guest here this morning. Miss Natalie's here today. Praise the Lord. Give that girl a hand, will you? <laughs> Natalie, can you eat candy bars? Yeah. Well, I got one. Would you come on down? I got a spare dog right here. How's that sound? Send Grandma down to get it if you don't want to get it. You better hurry, Grandma. You're in my preaching time. <laughs> but Felix was a wicked and ungodly man. And Paul, as he shares the gospel before Felix, he shares that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And when you move over to verse 24 in chapter 24, it says, And after certain days, when Felix, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And that's what he heard. 
And he reasoned, it says, verse 25, of righteousness. Do you need righteousness this morning? Yes, you do. Is my righteousness sufficient? No, it's not. Why is my righteousness not sufficient? Because I am corruptible. I am corruptible. All that I do, the good that I might do, still falls short of the righteousness that I need to make heaven my home. Amen? We need to have the righteousness of heaven. And the only way to get that righteousness is through Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is the imputed righteousness. And so when Paul preached to Felix and Drusilla, which was Jewish, uh, the Scriptures reason that he preached, or the Scriptures record that he preached righteousness, he preached temperance, and he preached a judgment to come. Felix, Felix was on his third marriage. And when you read a little bit of the history of this, this Drusilla was married to another man, and he persuaded Drusilla to divorce that man and to marry him. And so, obviously, as Paul is preaching the Word of God, preaching that there's a judgment to come, preaching that there is righteousness, God is a righteous judge, the Scriptures record that Felix trembled. And he said, Go thy way for this time when I have a more convenient season. I will call for thee. Many a sinner that you and I witness to and share our faith with will be convicted because their conscience will, will burden them about their life, about their walk, and when it comes to Christ, their, their conscience is pricking them concerning their sin. And like Felix, they will tremble. They will tremble because their conscience is not clear. Their conscience is not clear. And like Felix, many will say, go thy way when I have a more convenient time. Well, then as you move over into Acts chapter 25, Festus comes on the scene. And he inherits Paul's case from Felix. When you look at Festus as a leader, he wasn't interested in the truth, really. Festus epitomizes, I think, some of the DAs that we've seen on TV, trying to make a name for themselves, trying to, trying to play up to, the, to the, uh, the left, if you will say, of our world of our day, because that, if you read the account of, of Festus, that seems to be the kind of man he was. He was just another politician using his office to advance his career. And yet he knew the truth. In Matthew or in Acts chapter 25, in verse 9, it says, But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these before me? And then Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. Obviously, Festus knew the truth. He knew that Paul was innocent. He knew the charges that were charged against Paul were trumped up charges. He was brought to trial because the Jewish community were certainly envious of his ministry and what he was teaching and what he was doing. And they was trying to silence the apostle Paul. And Paul said to Festus, he says, you know the truth. Thou very well knowest the truth, he says. But he knew the Jews wanted to get rid of him. And Festus was playing to their favor. Why wouldn't Festus do the right thing? Because he was a politician. That's why he wouldn't do the right thing. He was a politician. Well, as you read on in Acts chapter 25 and verse 13, it says that after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to salute Festus, to congratulate him on his appointment that Rome had given him. And uh, Festus shares with Agrippa Paul's case in verse 14. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's case unto the king, saying, there's a certain man left in bonds by Felix. And Agrippa no doubt had heard about Paul, and he wanted to hear him speak. And so when you turn over to verse 22, then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself tomorrow. And said, and, and, uh, said he, thou shalt hear him. And so Agrippa, who came to congratulate Festus on his appointment by Rome, taking Felix's place, uh, heard about Paul, and Festus shared with Agrippa, and Agrippa said, well, I would like to hear this Paul myself share with me. And so in Acts chapter 26, as you follow on through here in the book of Acts chapter 26, Paul is brought before Agrippa, and like he has done in many other cases, he begins by sharing who the man, who he was 
what his life was like. In verse 10 of chapter 26, he says, which things I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests when uh, they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And Paul goes on to share the kind of man with Agrippa that he was in his past. We all have a past, don't we? We all have the kind of person that we were before we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if you look back at your past, you're not proud of your past. And sometimes the past lingers in our life and we have to deal with the past daily at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then Paul goes on to say what made the difference in his life. In verse 13, he says, At midday, O king, I, I saw in the way a light from heaven from above uh, uh, above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard the voice speaking to me and saying in Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. So Paul shares his testimony of how he received Jesus Christ. First he told him the kind of man that he was. And you know, you, you talk to any sinner who's been saved by grace, particularly men and women who were out there in the world like this friend of mine I was telling you with about, and he will share the testimony of the kind of man that he was, but what happened that night in his home when he invited Jesus Christ into his heart and life, his life, his life dramatically changed. I've told you before, when he got saved, he'd always been in the habit of playing golf with the guys on Wednesday night at that that. Great golf course, that PGA Tour golf course called Suburban. Um, playing with the men at on the golf course and coming in and buying the men a round of beer. Never gave it a thought. That night after he came to know Christ, that was a Wednesday night. I come home from Word of Life teaching Word of Life. He called me on the phone that night. He said, I did it, I did it, I did it. I said, who is this that did it? He said, this is Lee. I said, it is. You did what? And he told me I trusted Jesus Christ. And I went over to his house. He was crying like a baby. Now, the next Wednesday, he wasn't in church. He was on the golf course. He came back in. He bought a round of beer for everybody. But brother, let me tell you something. Something that happened in his heart. The Holy Spirit moved in. You see, that's what happens when you call out to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit moves in. And things begin to change. As I've said to you before, he begins to renovate the old house. And God began to renovate the heart of my friend Lee. Lee and I are not alike in any ways other than the fact that we're Christians. His personality is so, so outgoing. I'm not that kind of a person. So if I go out with Lee, I'm pretty uncomfortable because you never know what he's going to do next. It makes me very, very nervous being in his presence. He's just that kind of a guy. That's the kind of guy he is, but that's the kind of guy the Lord uses. And he uses him to a certain clientele of people because that personality really meshes with personalities like that. But your personality, my personality, whatever it might be, God has a clientele of people that you and I can mesh with and we can share with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what I want you to see is that when God moved into the heart of Lee that night, long ago, things changed in his life. Things changed in his life. And Paul is sharing with Agrippa what God did in his life, the kind of man that he was, and how he was captured by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and how things began to change in his life. His mission had changed. His purpose was to destroy Christians, but now his mission was, was to win men to Christ. As you read on in verse 17 in chapter 26, he said, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin. Paul's mission had changed. What changed it? Because Jesus Christ moved into his heart and into his life. There's a whole lot of potential out there in the world around this church right now. All we got to do is tap into that potential. And how do we tap into that potential? We introduce them the very best of our ability. We witness our faith to them about Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul was doing before Agrippa. He was witnessing his faith before Jesus Christ. Paul was a changed man. Verse 19, he says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. What he heard from God, he received. What he heard from God, he responded to. 
and the world was amazed. And the friends that Paul used to have who said, who gave him letters to go out and persecute and capture Christians were appalled because he wasn't working for them no more and it was going to become very costly to him because they were using Felix and Festus and now Agrippa to try to have Paul done away with. But was Paul intimidated? Not in the slightest. Paul says, Paul says in verse 21, and for this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Let me tell you something. When you stand up for Jesus Christ, the world's not going to like it. The world's not going to like it. And I'm pondering a message next Sunday along that line. When you and I stand up for Jesus Christ, the world's not going to like it. There's the spirit of Antichrist that is at work in the world this morning. We look at the world and we say, what in the world's going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. The spirit of Antichrist is at work in the world, preparing the world for this man of sin. And the world, I will assure you, hates the Word of God, hates the preaching of the Word of God, hates sounding the warning as what's going on in the world. The world hates that, and they will do everything in their power to silence that, and that's exactly what is happening here in this particular case and account with the Apostle Paul. Well, the Bible goes on to record that the Apostle Paul, he shares his testimony as he was sharing this testimony. Paul says, for this cause the Jews sought to, uh, caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. But then he goes on to share with Agrippa these truths. And Festus, if you read this account, Festus, who turned him over to Agrippa, for Agrippa to hear this testimony, Festus can't take it anymore. And in verse 24, this worldly man, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Listen, there will be men and women that you and I cross paths with that don't know Jesus Christ. Their heart is hard as stone. And when you share your faith, they will look at you as if you're some kind of a weirdo. Well, let them go on and look like I'm a weirdo. I like being a weirdo. It makes me feel good being a weirdo. They can think all they want to think as much as they want to think. But I'll guarantee you today, Festus is not thinking Paul was a weirdo. Today, Festus is in hell if he did not repent of his sin. He is in hell. And Paul says in verse 25, he says, I'm not mad. He says, I speak the truth. I speak the truth. And then in verse 26, watch what happens. For the king knoweth these things. That's Agrippa. He knoweth these things. Why does he know these things? Because if you study about Agrippa, Agrippa was an expert in Jewish customs. He says in verse 26, the king knoweth these things before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing, for this thing was not done in the corner. Now watch what happens in verse 27. Paul asks Agrippa, point blank. Now he's the king. He's a powerful man. Very powerful. He is responsible for persecution of men and women. All three of these men were very powerful men and were guilty of many, many uh, things along that line of persecution. Uh, men and women, they were just brutal kind of leaders. He says here, to King Agrippa, verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. And know what Agrippa says. Notice what Agrippa says in verse 28. And Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Point blank. Point blank. This man who was being examined for the charges that were charged against him turns to the king and he asks the king. He puts the king on the witness stand. He asks the king. He says, king, do you believe what the prophets have declared that Jesus Christ would come and live and die and be buried and be crucified and would rise again and he would do all of that so you and I could have our sins forgiven? Obviously, King Agrippa was very, very uncomfortable as you read this text. He was emotionally moved by what he heard. Paul could see that. He witnessed that. And Paul said to Agrippa, he says, I know, I know that you believe. I know that you understand. And Agrippa says in verse 28, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Many a man has been at that place of almost. So close. So close. If I had just a little bit more time, 
we could have almost scored the touchdown. If I had that ball more on line, I would have almost had that ball go in the hole over there at Putt-Putt. You could have had it on line. I think there's a little demons jumping up, pushing it out of there. That, that, that putt-putt course make you talk to yourself. I heard some of you. <laughs> but uh, Agrippa was almost, almost. My friend was almost. He said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. Herschel Ford in his commentary said this, the tragedy of Agrippa was the tragedy of almost. He almost repented of his sin. He almost accepted Christ. He almost became a child of God. He almost entered the kingdom of heaven. But he missed heaven and the glory of heaven because he simply was almost persuaded. Almost persuaded. Agrippa, if he never came to Christ, this morning he is in hell. And dear friend, in hell... Like the rich man we read about in the book of Luke chapter 16 in how he remembers, he remembers this opportunity that he had that was so close that he almost received. And he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What is a Christian? Well, if you do a poll, do a survey, if you ask most people, one of the friends of mine pulled in my driveway here a few weeks ago, and he wanted to talk. We haven't crossed paths. We haven't talked for a long, long time. He's a very worldly man, very ungodly man, but he's, he is civil around Christian men. He tames his tongue. He tries the best he can to tame his tongue. And uh, he was talking about this whole homosexual issue that we're seeing out there in the world and how he was sharing with someone. And he says, well, you know, if you believe the Bible like we Christians do, and I looked at him like we Christians do. Are you serious? My eyes blinked. My eyes began to, am I missing something here? Like we Christians do. Uh, but he understood what the Bible says about this whole homosexual issue. But he put himself in that family of being a Christian. And I wonder today, do men and women really know what a Christian is? It's not a name that you attach to yourself. It's not a pin that you put on your lapel and says, I'm a Christian. It's not a bunch of Sunday school pins that hang on your, we don't have that here like they used to, but we used to have Sunday school pins that go all the way down your chest and sometimes kids would wear them to church. That's not being a Christian. That name, that title was given to the Christians because of their life, because of their behavior, because of their speech, because their lives have been transformed by the power of the gospel. A Christian's life has been transformed by the power of the gospel. What is a Christian? A Christian is one who has received Christ into his heart to be his Savior. A Christian is one who belongs to Christ. A Christian is one who lives like Christ. And a Christian is one who wants to serve Christ. A man doesn't become a Christian by his works. Go with me back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, a man doesn't become a Christian by his works. What kind of works? Well, good works. Going to church, being a good person, and, and all of that. The Bible makes it clear in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18, for as much as you know that you're not redeemed with the corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain, from your vain, what does it say here? From your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers. The point is you can't buy your way into heaven. You can't buy your way out of hell. He goes on to say, how are you redeemed? But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. See, that's what Paul said to Agrippa. Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? What did the prophets say? The prophets said that Jesus Christ was going to come, that Jesus was going to step out of heaven. That's what the prophets said. And Paul said, Agrippa, I know you believe it. Agrippa was under tremendous conviction. And he says, almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. A man doesn't become a Christian by his good works. Before a man can become a Christian, he has to take responsibility for his sin. He has to see that it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not you, not you, not you. It's me. It's my sin that I need someone to pay the price for because I cannot pay that price. But Jesus came because he so loved the world and he paid the debt that set me free so that I could be redeemed. 
A man, before he can become a Christian, must take the next step. He must realize that he needs to take responsibility before he receive, for his sin before he can receive the gift of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. A man, before he becomes a Christian, must understand that there is a price to be paid on my sin. The wages of my sin is death. Jesus took my death at the cross. If I don't become a Christian and receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, then I will get my condemnation. My due judgment will come to me. Question is asked, how does a man become a Christian? The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Someone says, well, preacher, what do you mean receive Jesus? What's involved in receiving Jesus? Well, when you lead someone to the Lord, what do you do? We like to, there's many places you can go to, but I like to go back to the book of Romans chapter 10. You can go to the gospel of John. You can go to several books in the Bible. You can, you can hear the gospel in the book of Exodus. But here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... Why did Jesus go to the cross? He went to the cross for my sins. So what's involved there? There has to be repentance. There has to be repentance. It's not just believing in my head in Jesus, but I have to repent of my sin, why he came, why he died for my sin. He went to the cross and took the punishment for my sin at the cross. So there must be repentance. If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. So in the heart of man, there needs to be this understanding why Jesus came. He came to die for your sin and my sin. And only he alone could pay the debt for your sin and my sin. And I come before that throne of grace and cry out for the mercy of Almighty God. And I repent of the sin that I am, the sinner that I am, the sin that I have confessed, that I confess it before him. And I believe what he did, what he came to do. He was born, he, was, he lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended to the Father, and one day he's coming again. And the Bible says, verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the Bible sounds a warning this morning to us as believers and men and women who are non-believers that is the warning of almost. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? This salvation is so great a salvation. How shall we escape? There will be no escape. There will be no escape. Festus. Felix and Agrippa will throughout eternity gnash upon their teeth because opportunity was at the door. Opportunity was before them. All they had to do was do what the Bible says, repent of their sin, take responsibility for their sin, and call out to Jesus Christ to save them from their sin. It was theirs. They could have had it simply by receiving by faith. And the scriptures asked the question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says it this way. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. How many men and women do you and I have the opportunity to witness to, share faith with, to give a reason of the hope that's within us? And for them, they hear it like water off the back of a duck. What does the Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 say? For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You have to ask yourself the question, why would Agrippa, what could have possibly been in the mind of this great king who was emotionally, spiritually moved by what he heard from the lips of the apostle Paul? I think you have to look at pride, no doubt. What will people think of me? And is that not what men and women say to themselves today? They're connected in the world like my friend was. He was connected in the world. He had his fingers in this and fingers in that. He had a lot of connections out there in the world. What will people think of me? What would my wife think of me? What would my friends think of me if I confess that I'm a sinner? Agrippa was living with Bernice. Bernice was not his wife. Bernice was his sister. And he was having an immoral relationship with Bernice. 
No doubt Agrippa thought to himself, well, if I receive this Jesus, it's going to have to be a 180. <laughs> There's going to have to be a change of direction. And I don't know that I want to give up Bernice and this folly that I'm having with her. He was addicted to his sin. His sin caused him to almost be persuaded to receive Jesus Christ. Pride is a powerful force. Agrippa might have thought to himself, well, what, 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 what will happen if the heads of state, the heads of Rome, the Jewish community over which I rule, what will they think? I might end up like the Apostle Paul, standing before me in chains. And Agrippa said, it's too much of a price. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 8. We're just about done. Mark, chapter 8, and verse 36. The Bible says in Mark, chapter 8, verse 36, For what shall a man give, in, for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What is almost a Christian? It's to see your need and not confess it. It's to wish to be saved but remain undecided. It's to be at the door and still be on the outside. I trust this morning that if the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, someone's heart, here in this sanctuary, someone maybe who has certainly given the semblance of being a Christian, it's easy to do that on Sunday, coming to church in a Christian church, and you learn the language, you learn how to conduct yourself. But when you walk outside of this church and the life you live outside of this church doesn't reflect the life that you should live as a believer in Jesus Christ. No, none of us here are perfect, but we're growing in his grace. Amen. And when we are, don't do what we should do, we tell the Lord we're sorry for what we shouldn't have done. And the Bible says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That's part of the growing process. One day we have this blessed hope to know that one day when he comes, we'll be like unto him. And we'll never ever again have to deal with temptation and testing and all of that that goes with being in the flesh in this world. But just the same as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, our life is being transformed daily, drawn closer to him. As you look at your life this morning, can you say that Christ is in your heart? Can you say that Christ has moved into your old house? Can you say that there is renovation going on in your life, in your marriage, in your home, in your heart? Maybe you're like Agrippa. Maybe the spirit of pride is just, what will people think? Well, they thought I've been a Christian all these years. What will they think if I confess I'm a Christian? And then I must confess and tell people. That's what the scripture says. I'm not to be ashamed of what's happened in my heart. And I'm to tell people. He says, if you don't confess me, I'll be ashamed to confess you. That's your decision. As much as I want you to make that decision. I can't do it. All I can do is give it out. Set the table. Set the dishes. Put the silverware. Put the meat. Put the mashed potatoes. Put it all on the table. Now it's time to eat. Will you come to the table? Will you receive it? Or will you be like Felix? When I have a more convenient time. Or maybe you'll be like Festus. This is a bunch of hogwash. Or maybe you'll be like Agrippa, moved in your spirit, moved. Oh, how you long to. But if I do, then what? You take the first step and watch what the Lord does with the rest of your life. Watch what the Lord does the rest of your life. Father, we thank you for the word. We ask you to bless it to our hearts this morning. Should there be a soul here today or many that need to make that decision? have that assurance in their heart of hearts that they know you as their Lord and Savior. God, you gave this message today for, to this church for this reason, for this hour, because there are no doubt souls here today that have not made that decision. 
not surrender their all to you. And they need to do that, for it's too late. Because one day it will be too late. One day they will have gone too far. One day the door of opportunity will close. Father, I pray that today they'll respond to your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your hymn of the